Uh, David, Deathly Hallows Part 2 is a thrilling, almost operatic epic. How important was it for you to keep things grounded, though, in the characters and emotions, while also not forgetting some moments of levity, of, of course, in the yeah. film? Yeah, I think that, that was absolutely, you've defined it perfectly. That's, that was the challenge, really. And I think the most important thing was to stay with the characters, stay with their story. And there's all this battle going on around the school and there's all this spectacle and there are dragons and spiders and giants. But ultimately we're following Harry's story with his friends. So <clears throat> that was, for me, that's the key to making it all believable and more exciting. Because there are lots of easy ways to do big battles, but big battles in themselves are not that exciting unless you're following someone you really care about. Absolutely. Um, and a lead character is uh, mortally wounded at one point at the hands of Voldemort, Voldemort um, only to be offered up as well as a snack for Nagini. Um, and you've created a befittingly sort of disturbing set of images there. Yes. But how challenging was that, again, to strike the balance of being rather grim, obviously, but not sort of too scary for perhaps younger audience members as well? Yeah, we actually, we don't normally hold back. You know, we, we I say to the young, we, I saw some young kids the other day who were going into the film and I said, um, you know, it's kind of scary, but they like being scared. So we were, the one thing I wanted to do more than anything in that scene is feel for Snape, feel for his kind of, um, the emotion of the scene at the end. But it is quite scary and it is quite horrible seeing a snake kill someone, um, especially in the Guinea. And how much did you relish the opportunity to really explore the character of Voldemort this time around with, with Ray Fiennes? Oh, cool. It's a real treat, because Ray's a wonderful actor, and he's very open. And one of the techniques I would use with Ray is I would... You know, normally when you shoot a scene with an actor, you go, action, does this, do the lines, and we cut. And with Ray, I would keep going. So I'd go, action, and I wouldn't cut. And I said, right, let's do it again. And so Rafe had the opportunity to explore moments and ideas and just things about Voldemort that would often surprise him or surprise me. And it was a very instinctive way of finding the character. And what was your kind of overriding principles for the look of Hogwarts this time around um, for Stuart Craig, your production designer, to create? I mean, I think a more moody colour palette, um, for one thing, I imagine, and it kind of had the feeling of kind of militaristic prison almost with the marching and, and that yeah. thing that was going We on. went for a very monochromatic palette to just make everything feel a little bit more austere, particularly in the first third of the movie at Hogwarts. But then latterly, as the heroes start to fight back, the colours start to warm up slightly. So you get sort of a slightly, there are a lot of reds in the movie, so reminiscent of blood and fire. So there's a lot of blood and a lot of fire, basically. Um, and that's what gives it that operatic feel, I think, that you see. And Alexandra uh, Desplat has composed another beautiful um, and varied score, but I wondered how important it was for you to have some moments of calm and quiet sequences, such as when they land in the lake after the Gringotts sort of bank heist. Yeah, no, and the scene that we decided, I think Alexandre's done a beautiful job with the music, and we used the London Symphony Orchestra, and they're always a treat, actually. But um, the scene we decided not to put music on very purposefully was Heaven, King's Cross, when Harry dies and goes back and sees Dumbledore. And um, I just felt you can't score heaven. There's no, there's only cliches that you can use. And so um, we, we purposefully avoided music. And that quietness and that stillness after all the big battle is really haunting. And I believe this is the first time that we've actually seen Parcel Tongue subtitled on screen, the language that's sort of been created by Dr. Francis Nolan. Why was it important to do that this time around? And are you able to say anything in Parcel Tongue? Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't say anything in Parcel Tongue, and if I did, you would never understand me anyway. So, um, but we do have this wonderful professor who comes up with that language, and we have used it before, but not subtitled. You're quite right, and um, it's it's it sounds a bit like a cross between Welsh and um, Arabic. It's a really intriguing mix. Actually, it sounds a bit more Welsh than Arabic, I would say, but. Um, and it's quite fun, quite creepy. David Yates, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, man. Yeah, good. Thanks, man.